we've got with us or joined us back we've got Lawrence from Alemba we've got Pat from Hornbill Tom from Halo ITSM and obviously David who's still with us from Sunrise Software are we all there gentlemen Uh, we've David's got one here. there. Yes. <laughs> got one. <laughs> David's two. I'll, I think I'll join the party, guys. I can feel I can feel the love in the room. That's great. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you for joining us today. And, and hopefully we've got a chance to just elaborate on some of the stuff that we've that we've witnessed today and talked about. I don't know if you've heard the last um, session that we did, but I think we'll sort of, you know, mirror some of that a little bit, I think, right? Um so let's maybe start with what you're what you're finding with your customers right now. What types of challenges are they dealing with? What what are they asking you about? Right? It may include ESM. It may not. I don't know. Right? So what are the what are your customers asking about right now? What are the biggest challenges? And we'll start with let's start with maybe Lawrence. So I, th I think um, the the biggest challenge now is is reconnecting the workforce to the services themselves because obviously. The workforce has been cast asunder with with the pandemic, and people really had to, you know, massive um, deployments of things like teams to manage, you know, for collaboration, networking, what needed to be on VPNs, what doesn't need to be on VPNs, what is directly in the cloud, um, because of course everyone can't just move everything magically to the cloud. We all are still stuck with quite a massive hybrid structure at the moment, so. Um, that's probably what's been, you know, a lot of our customers have been out for the last little while is sorting that mess out. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. And, and same to you, Pat. Um, what, what, what type of challenges are customers talking to you about? What are they bringing up? What do they want to know about? We're seeing a, a huge drive for automation um, and, and not just kind of um, behind the firewall stuff in IT operations, but actually in other areas of the business as well. So kind of the speed of process design, the ability to do things themselves, that's really, really important to organizations right now. Um, and we're hearing a lot, uh, getting a lot of requests about how IT organizations approach different parts of the organization about uh, enterprise service management. So one of the first things we're telling them there is don't call it that. Um, mm. <laughs> because if you go cap in hand, they'll think it's another IT solution. You're trying to mm. shove down their throats and change the way that they work. Um, so what we're suggesting there is, and basically a lot of our customers have taken that approach, is to basically go and solve a problem for them. Understand, don't come as, a, as an IT department, but go and say, what are your biggest challenges? What's the one thing if you could solve it now? And typically, when you ask customers these things, the same things that IT suffered from 20 years ago, inability to prioritize, stuff in mailboxes getting lost, all of that things, but they don't realize that they're working in an incredibly inefficient way. So. That, I think, is the area that uh, is getting the most level of interest at the moment, how to solve specific business challenges. And a lot of customers are now doing that quite quite successfully. Mm, good. Thank you. Tom, same question to you, please. So in the short term, we're getting a lot of well, a lot of conversations around moving back into the offices and how kind of that migration from working from home back into working in the office. It does create some slightly different conversations that we need that we're used to and more around um like desk booking and how we can actually reserve a place in the office and all those kind of things which are slightly different from the normal it challenges that kind of the traditional ones where we're in the office and we're working um so there's a lot around that and also there's the it's had a lot of visibility over the last couple of years it's been celebrated in a lot of places from the, the ability to get everyone working from home so quickly and it's just how that momentum gets maintained and how we can actually use some of the, the good things, a lot of the good things that IT um, provides, those kind of mature processes, how that can be pushed out to the rest of the organization. So they're the kind of two key things that we've come up a lot recently. Good. Thank you. And David, same question, please. Yeah, sure. I was really interested. I think a lot of common uh, themes have come out from, from Pat and Tom and Lawrence I'd agree with, to be fair. I think it's a hybrid, isn't it? It's almost like dealing with people, the challenges are dealing with people remotely, but also possibly the same people are then in the office. So it's dealing with remote and I guess mobile workers. So what we're finding is, yes, there's lots of good tools out there that are helping people with some of it like Microsoft Teams and so on and so forth. So certainly from our, our point of view, um, we focus on the integration side. So you know, if you're using a service management tool, make sure it, it, it seamlessly talks to things like Teams and, and it kind of works with what you do. But yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So like I said, 
people are working more mobile uh, than ever before. And as Tom rightly said, they also throw at you. But we want to be in the office two or three days a week as well. So you've got to, you've got to deal with all of it, haven't you? So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's sort of, I think you're right, that multi, multi-channel, omni-channel sort of stuff we were talking about forever ago, really, when it seems like now it's pretty much the norm, isn't it? How we consume, how we consume technology like that through through any channel that that um you know is available and, and we want to use right now thank you for that we, t- we talked last time on the last q a about uh, enterprise service management about unified service management we've got to making things you know sound great and we, we are you know and i think i think barkley barkley ray um and his sidekick have been doing a lot on uh, on some co- podcasts recently uh, i think a few of you guys may be been on it actually and where, where barkley just pretty much talks about um when i last spoke to him was was just about working differently. That's pretty much what it is. Working working more more, more effectively. So if I was asked to ask you guys, right, each to define in its simplest form, not a textbook, nothing that's been written by some some guy in a in a I don't know in a lab somewhere, right? In the simplest form, what 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 would you say that the premise of enterprise service management really is? All right, and I'm going to start with with you, Pat, if you don't mind. In the simplest form. I've- I think basically, I, I, my session there was called the biggest opportunity for IT since IT, and I think that's what it is. So, I mean, we've been focused on improving our lot and kind of getting green metrics and all that type of thing, but actually, if you're not demonstrating highly visible business value, you face a real threat of outsourcing over the next little while, that's for sure. And I think the, the way that we've seen success within our customer organizations is people get noticed when they start doing things across the rest of the business. And all the typical challenges you have is we don't have the money, we don't have the time, we don't have the people, et cetera. So that tends to go away when you're doing those things. So, um, yeah, deliver highly visible business value and it has to be done. Get out of your silo. That would be my mm-hmm. piece of advice. And what's interesting there, I think, you know, we've talked like that and we for years about the value of IT and being seen not as a cost centre, value centre. And I'm wondering if the rest of the organisation is now starting to talk like that about themselves in the organisation or if they're not, at what point that happens. So you talk about the end to end, the enterprise as a value stream, not as a not as a independent, you know, independent, you know, different ways of working, different budgets and all that. So I, I've, and I and I'm, I'm probably need to read more about that, how, how other parts of the organization see themselves in that, you know? So that's great, thank you for that. Let's 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 go to Tom then. Similar question is at the simplest level, Tom, what, what is, how would you define uh, enterprise service management? For me, it's just about delivering a great service. Um, it's as simple as that. It's users are used to having this awful experience of having to go to one portal to log an issue about a I don't know a socket not working, another portal to log an IT issue, and mm. it's horrible. Um, so for me, it's all about unifying it, the whole service platform, um, making it the best experience as we can for our our users, and at the end of the day, getting people so they're not wasting time, kind of trying to work out where they need to go and doing all these horrible things. Um, go to one place, wherever, go to them, go to their team's channels, go to a single portal, um, just making it as easy for people so they can get back to doing what they do best. Um, they're, they're valuable resources throughout the business, all the people are. They don't want to spend time kind of logging, kind of wasted energy on logging tickets mm. in places. Um, so that's kind of where for me, great experience all around. That's great, thank you. David, over to you, same, same question, please. Yeah, sure. I, I guess the kind of way I'm, I'm why I probably won't surprise you to know that I kind of see it from the, obviously the software point of view to a certain extent. So it's really mm-hmm. about looking at, um, you know, how can you use ITSM and ITIL principles to help other areas of the business? And I absolutely um, would follow up from what Tom says. So I would see that as, OK, so, you know, you you use a service management tool as most companies do. Um, how can that make uh, how can the software solve the problems of other business units and, you know, quite often if i was so if i was an end user i'd absolutely want a one-stop shop i wouldn't see the benefit personally in going to one place to log a ticket for hr another place to log a ticket for it it would be a duplicated effort wouldn't it and it would seem needless so for me it's it's yeah looking at how software uh, can support different business units with with, with the itsm principles behind it thank you and and lawrence again if you could just answer that one that would be great yeah, thanks. Just maybe to add a little bit more onto what, what's already been said is, is all right. But I think if we take one step back, the, you know, the challenges and the opportunity are really putting um, what are effects for the logistical processes, i.e. idle processes, behind other departments, which really then help you understand 
a lot of what your business is doing that you may not have understood before because a lot of those departments can be quite black box like how does mm. hr do a mm. payroll query well probably no one really knew but now that has to be yeah. defined put into software you know so this becomes a software definition of the process and i think the other area that in enterprise service management where we can really add value back into the business is to help businesses understand the cost of service provision and whether they're doing it the right way so you know a, a big thing i think that will be in the next which is more it focused in a way but i think one of the big challenges for the next five years is managing cloud costs because the cloud is not cheap everyone's like oh it'll be cheaper it's not cheap and these costs are starting to uh, become aware and bubble up to customers as you know massive bills from aws and azure are landing yeah. on people's on people's desks and they're you know completely unexpected you know server sprawl server things like this so all of that across the enterprise everyone's going to have to, you know and as most services are now delivered with software across all departments all departments will need to be subject to those uh, processes to control the costs of service provision mm, yeah that's a fair point actually Thank you for that. Um, we talked in the last one as well about uh, enterprise knowledge management because there's a lot of there's, this is all sort of interrelated, isn't it? You know, when, you, when we talk about enterprise service management, it's not just a tool; it's the culture. Um, there's an awful lot in there. And we've seen some of that today, which is great. So, trying to trying to you know drive an organisation towards this collaborative, uh, very effective, contributing culture um, to, towards that knowledge working thing. And, I, and I, I've got a question about sort of, um, we talked about single destination and destination application uh, before, um, uh, Pat. Um, and, and I want I want you guys, I, I, I certainly want to understand, if you're in an organization where you've got multiple, uh, you know, um, systems that are in use, uh, and you're trying to provision this single way of working across an organization. How how do you optimize that? How do you how do you rationalize what you've got there? And and maybe I don't know have a bun fight with somebody in HR over 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 the way that they work uh, and and try to uh, um, uh, convince them, uh, encourage them, influence them to look at a different way of working. So it's it's all very well to put these premises and tools and philosophies in place but how do you actually turn the organization not just into another another level of different way of working but actually orchestrate that optimize that for what asm really should be and i'm going to start with that i know that i'm not sure if that's a question or a statement right so i'm going to throw that in uh, i'm going to ask david if you don't mind yeah so the premise of you know we've got this stuff we've gone in with another tool a new way of working how do you actually make that really happen you know it is about optimization yeah, really i think isn't it isn't it about optimizing optimizing how an organization works yeah uh, great question to be fair david and i think some advice I got from Sunrise when I started a long time ago is just because you can do something doesn't always mean you you should basically. And the reason I'm saying that is probably all of the vendors, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, and, and the other vendors online now, all tools are very flexible, right? So you, you can you can change them and configure them to a certain extent. So I think what you're basically saying, David, is well, HR, for example, pick on HR will have their own processes, but actually. Um, yeah, how should we engage with them to to, to 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 kind of get them on board using a service management tool? And I think you know, your obvious point, but I think it's worth making. I think it's, it's business business analysis is really important, isn't it? It's looking at their processes and working out the best way to map them into a tool. Um, and in my opinion, somewhere in the middle will be a happy medium. You know, I, I don't believe someone should slavishly adhere to a tool that dictates exactly how you have to work. But I absolutely believe that software should empower a user so it can be very we would use the word configure it can be very easily configured um, to what they can do so to summarize it um, yeah I'd say engage with them um, do the proper analysis and then strategically change the tool um, to support where they um, how they want to work and don't be don't be frightened to challenge it as well yeah thank you mark was a mid next point earlier one of the questions that um he brought up um and i'm going to bring it up again to you right because I, th I think it's part of this kind of part of the conversation really mark said that esm uh, is usually in his experience from uh, an it direction uh, from itsm um you know tool onwards into the organization but is it better is a better path um, from the enterprise back into IT, and I think it's the same same kind of question. And last time we talked about doing it both ends. Yeah, so similar thing, uh, Lawrence. How does all how does all that work then? Right? How do we how do we get sort of people on the bus towards this this sort of single destination, this destination application, this one way working? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And this was, you know, I've played many tricks in in the game to to make that happen. It's never one size fits all. I mean, the, I think the biggest thing is to try and get each department to make it make this transformation process their own and to get them to own it and be part of it. And I think if you don't do that, ultimately you'll fail because they'll just some find some way to circumvent it. So you've got to let them uh, make it their own. Uh, you know, in terms of software, we've done lots of tricks using our partitioning functionality where we give everyone their own system and then drop, the, you know, we, we had one big client in America where they had 15 departments and they all wanted to be completely separate. So they had 15 different tools to start with. So we put them all on the same tool, but they could all be different. So they were all firewalled. And then their boss started to drop the firewalls one at a time and bring them together and get them to working together so calls were shared, they could share out of hours work, that kind of thing. So, you know, there are tricks you can play with the software to bring it in and then bring them in slowly to, you know, like bring the horse to water very slowly. Um, so there are things the software can help with, but ultimately it's a, it is a people thing and you do need to get them, you do, you do need to get them bought in. And, you know, in, in, in that category, actually, a really interesting ha thing happened where with the, with the pandemic, um, a whole, nearly all of one of the group's IT people were sick. And fortunately, the week before, the boss had dropped the firewall between them and another department. And he said, OK, um, John's uh, team can help you today because they were in a panic. They didn't have any people. They're like, John's, pe John's team can take the load with you to go. They go oh, that's great. And they never even thought about how that was now possible. <laughs> um, nice, they had nice, the thank you. The wall on, between them. So uh, yeah, 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 that, yeah, that's a good way. But ultimately each team had to be bought in and each team has mm -hmm. to, to own their part. And Pat, in, in your experience, again, same question, right? From the organizations you may have worked with, how, how have you overcome that? Or what does it really mean to drive towards that single way of working? Well, well the first thing is this is not tools thing at all. Yeah, the tools, I'll, I'll cover that. Very briefly, all the tools can do, you've seen loads of demos today that can do amazing stuff. So the only difference between them is how easy it is to achieve that. You know, do you need to write code? What's involved with upgrades? How often do software releases come out? How's that going to impact you? So let's set the tool aside. Those are the things you need to consider. This is a cultural shift. You're trying to explain to people that there's a better way of doing things. And the only way to do that is to basically guide them with solving one of their problems and actually encourage them to take on more of their challenges themselves. I mean, we have, you mentioned Barclays podcast, so I was mm -hmm. on there, I think the last episode, this episode 26, I think, I was on there with one of our customers, Darren Rose from Vinci Construction. Um, Darren's came up through the ranks in IT. He is now part of a, a service management team. They've only got three people. He got uh, two service management um, uh, architects with him. And their job is solely to go to the organization and say, look, we can help you work a little bit better. We can speed things up. We can just make your employees more productive. Just tell us how you work. What are your challenges? Let's see how we can solve that particular thing. Once you've done that, you get the knock on the door. Hey, can we do this as well? Can we do that as well? Because they find it is actually a far better way of working and they're dropping less stuff and losing less stuff, keeping customers informed and setting their expectations. So this is a cultural thing. Don't go with the solution. Go with the, the intent to solve one of their biggest problems. Show them how easy it is to do and hand over the reins when they're ready. That's the way to get this thing going. Sounds like an, an evangelist, an internal yeah. evangelist for your impact, isn't it, really, isn't it? Uh, yes, isn't it? Tom, same, same to you. Same question, please. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what the other guys are saying. Getting people in, involved early in the projects, if you... That's kind of a maybe a secondary step to say once they've already agreed to it, then absolutely you've got to get them in at the start of the process, make them the owners of it, make it all from from there. But to me, for me, the key is to to give them a reason to do it, a reason to want to to adopt this new tool and get involved with everyone else. And just I've got an example here, just that one I had the other day, which is um, big big customer of ours in the UK. They they use it for IT. Um, and not not anything else at the moment, just IT. Um, and they basically kept getting all these new staff members, and they had all these new new starters, new joiners to cope with the extra demand. And they were getting people come up to them from from HR, and it's like, how are you able to get all these people? We're we're completely swamped, but we don't have the people to. And they won't let us have any more. And 
and th they just brought up a report from the software and it's like this is this is the increase in in volume this is the increase in demand that we've had um then they gave us more people um and the other departments were just using i don't know other tools or, or mailboxes and things like that and they couldn't produce those numbers so they weren't getting the people to solve their problems so you've you've got to give them a reason to want to use a tool and whether it's a yeah some data that can give them the, the extra resource they need then maybe that's one of the reasons yeah good thank you now we're almost on time right but i do want to ask one more question if, if you don't mind hanging on guys and this is about citizen development you know there's an awful lot of there's a lot of stuff that's happening i think that's sort of um you know converging in some way shape or form ways of working right so it it, it incorporates all, a lot, an awful lot of stuff doesn't it what we're talking about now so if you look at citizen development if you look at sort of um low code no code sort of systems um what what type of thing are you seeing with that right if you look at product design if you look at user application if you look at the premise of citizen development um what, what i suppose what is it right what do you see as citizen development maybe right and how how, how does that work in organizations and how are you shaping your products to incorporate that kind of democratized decision making in an organization yeah hope that's not too big a question we're going to start with tom yeah so we always suggest the way we've always built it up is is no code um it's the way that you allow basically ideas to scale without needing to involve extra people extra developers um people to um basically take away from the key ideas and the key decision makers throughout so we've always built on no code it allows people to basically build those flows and build those processes without having to have those that extra knowledge those extra skills of development which can often get in the way and make everything take ages and um it's not yeah it's not a, a platform that's conducive to delivering a great platform um so for us yeah the future is no code um all the platforms you've seen today um pretty sure a no code um and yeah it's the future it's the way things are going um yeah yeah thank you pat same question then what does that mean to you as you're developing your stuff uh well basically we started that way in 2015 when we first released the, the this product um so uh, with our previous product it was incredibly powerful but uh you know, there's a million and, and one ways to do things and we wanted to solve that problem for customers the other thing we wanted to solve was uh, upgrades so we we don't do releases at all we just basically we push out incremental updates those happen every few days every few weeks whatever it happens i think over the last year we've done about 650 updates customers just but basically get the update there's no downtime there's no there's nothing for them to do. So increasingly you're seeing the vendors doing all the heavy lifting, backups, resilience, architectural improvements, all of those type of things. The vendors are doing all of that. The flexibility then is provided by the tools. So the two things I'd encourage you to look at when people say we're no code, um, there will be no code solutions out there that offer very limited configuration capabilities. So you'll get to a point where you just basically, you know, you can't do a hell of a lot more with it. Um, so I would say look for loosely coupled integrations. So things like uh, integrating with online tools, integrating behind the firewall stuff. If someone can't show you that in a point and click environment, uh, if you can't see how you would automate that yourself with anyone, as I mentioned earlier on in my session, um, the London Borough Walton Forest, that was um, six months effort by a, a, a HR team from start to finish to basically get a 36% reduction in their time to onboard staff. IT had no involvement apart from setting up the initial process of rolling. That's what needs to be, the tools need to be capable of doing that. And no code should mean precisely that. So if you, you're talking about no code, ask the vendors about how you deal with detailed integrations. Um, if that's not point and click, then you should be looking out for alarm bells. Ask them about things like how to handle there are software development releases. You know, do they push them out on a regular basis? What's involved in that? Does do they need to do anything? Are there test production uh, and development environments? Because if there are, chances are you're not looking at a second generation kind of cloud native SaaS tool. Mm. Mm, good, thank you. Over to you, Lawrence. Same, same question. Then, you know, when when you're looking at citizen development as a, as a theme that's developing, um, how, how are you addressing that in design, and, and what do you think that looks like in the future as a thing, I suppose, in organisations? Yeah, so th this is a this is a big uh, development that we've um, our, our product was always designed as a low uh, um, 
a no code solution with a graphical workflow builder uh, way back <laughs> since about 2000. But um, what, what this has expanded into is really being able to take control of itself, which is a weird thing to say, but not all tools can control their own internal things like, you know, adding users, adding CIs, deleting CIs, adding new processes themselves, like building a new workflow from a workflow. Not many tools can actually do that kind of thing. So taking control of themselves within that workflow environment and then external applications. Um, and we, we've done a lot of that. So we had one customer in Germany who um, had a massive problem with onboarding new staff and we were able to build with them very quickly in, in less than a month, four workflows that reduced their IT time spent on Active Directory management from 75% of the group's time down to 15%. So massive sort of changes like that. But the other thing we've expanded as well is we, we really leverage, um, you know, the Microsoft is your platform, which is really, really powerful. And you can embed parts of that inside our application. So it's all very well seeing your, your application is zero code, but that does always have limits. So what we've done is really opened the doors to those limits and said, well, okay, this is what our tool does. And if you want to do something different, like say you were an insurance company, you want to put in a complex uh, insurance risk calculator into the into tickets that customers are logging or something about customer complaints, you absolutely could then embed like on your Canvas app to do that. And that won't break the upgrades, it won't break our system, it keeps isolated. It gives people the ability to do absolutely genuinely anything they want, including the insertion of code. So if the no code part of Azure can't do what they want to do, they can drop down into C Sharp, they can drop down into Visual Basic and just do what they want to do. So it's it's like having your cake and eating it, but it won't break the application. So it doesn't do all the horrible things, which was you start to code it and then you can upgrade it and all that stuff. Is it, it isolates it, it keeps it in its own bubble. And that gives customers really the benefit of both because you know no zero code application could do everything. That's the whole point of code is you can do anything. So it gives you that advantage. And that is becoming a big thing. I mean, that's really enabling us to do, um, you know, a lot, a lot of um, new things in new areas that um, are more one-offs for customers where it wouldn't be something we want to core product. So, so, you know, so, some of mine want to do something weird and you think, okay, well, no one else would ever want it. So it wouldn't be worth putting into core products. So it really allows that flexibility. Mm, good. Thank you. And David, finally, same question yeah. to you then. Yeah, sure. I, I think there's some fair points being made. I mean, certainly from a Sunrise point of view, um, our history is the same as well. So around about 15 years ago, we started developing an application from the ground upwards as a configurable process builder, basically. So um, zero code, um, you know, call it call it uh, hindsight, call it right place, right time, you know. All, all software needs a bit of hindsight and a bit of obviously uh, doing the right thing at the right time. But to be honest with you, it, it's kind of an idea now that sort of right from the get-go of our latest application, a bit like what Pat alluded to, it's always been a you know, a no code process builder. You know, I, I myself can't write in a code, uh, but I can build business processes. And uh, I think someone else made the point as well. It's not just in Sunrise, it's hooking into other tools like Azure and integrations, you know, that can all be configured um, in our application. So that's that's kind of our view really is, is make, make, make it easy. People don't want to have to le learn a product and a coding language. People want to just have to learn a product to be fair. Mm, good, excellent guys. Thank you for that. That was a um, uh, great, great chat. Thank you for, for being involved today as well again. And I'm sure we're going to do this again at some point. So we'll, hopefully we'll see you soon. So thank you for that. And um, have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Nice Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, good. Okay. Now, hopefully you can see that. Uh, my, my desktop there. Fingers crossed. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, that, that's pretty much the end of today it's been um it's really been again always always fun to do these with with uh, some of the uh, very intelligent and knowledgeable people that we get involved with these which is great um before we close there's a, a reminder about sdi's um 2022 awards so submissions for the awards are now open but they will close on october the 22nd so you need to be pretty quick because it's not an easy process to put this in it's quite it's quite you know time consuming um if you want to be involved with that please submit uh, as soon as you can 
um, if you're considering to submit an entry. There are seven award categories for 2022, and they cover uh, the best in people, in teams, in transformation, continual improvement, and uh, resilience. And in March 22, March 2022, we'll be recognizing and celebrating achievements of the people and teams working in IT service and support. And uh, you can find more of that and just how to uh, uh, submit uh, on the website, on SCI website, just go to the SCI website and uh, look for events and networking on the top menu. And there's a link there as well. Good. Well, that uh, that is literally it, I think. I think that's it. It's been uh, really great to be part of today. It's been a pleasure to be uh, host again. Um, thanks for all our speakers and event partners for, for joining us today and sharing their thoughts. It's been great to listen and interact. Thank you also to Holly at STI for organizing and managing today's uh, event. And finally, thank you to you. Our listeners for taking the time out today to join us. We'll see you next time. Until then, good luck. Thank you.